All right, praise the Lord. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. What a blessed week. Continue also praying for both Slowinskis, uh, Brother Mike and Sister Teresa. They both fell. Yeah. I said, man. One's hurt, one hurt her back, the other, well, she hurt her back, and he, he kind of fell and smashed his face. Never a good thing, eh? Man, I said, man, you're ugly enough. You can't make it any worse. Come on now. At least I made him laugh. He's, he, he, I could get away with that. Other people I can't get away with. It. <laughs> All right, Second Peter chapter 3. You know, I, I'm going to confess something here. Don't, get, don't judge me, okay? You ready? As you see, other churches in, in the state of New York and around the country, they have a lot of things that we don't. And yes, does it make me a little, I wish we had it type of thing, like, like a teen class, a, a, a stronger children's ministry, even like a, even a mini choir, okay? But I'm going to tell you something. God makes churches unique to itself, amen? You look all to the bow, the church at Ephesus, the church at Philippi, their church, they all have a specialty. They have a different uniqueness and flavor to their churches. As you read those epistles, the church at Thessalonica, amen? Every church has a specialty for what God has made them for, right? And I want to thank you. Some of you guys, I know who you are. I know, I hear your testimony. I know what God has done in your life. And praise the Lord, I think that's why you're here. I really believe I want to rejoice today, and I want you to rekindle something in your heart today, the type of church that we are. We're a city church, amen? Yeah. We're not a country pumpkin church, and that's okay. You know, we're, we're unique in itself. We're not a suburban church. We're really not. You know, we're, we are a city church. We're in a, special, we're in a special field that we have to plant seed and water to go after, amen? It's a different, different kind of folks that you're dealing with in the city than the burbs. I'm telling you, the country scares me. Now, you heard my story. I'm going to repeat it. I preached at a church in Farmington, New York, all right? We're outside of Canandaigua. It's my first pastor's church. Now, Brother Byron, we drove out there, right? And Brother Harry, you drove out there, Pastor Ray Drake. When he first moved out of Buffalo to go to Rochester, he found this old farmer's grange, right? Which is the church house. They used to, all the farmers used to meet there and talk about their crops and their condition, how they're going to distribute. So they let them rent it out. He let them rent out that place the whole year, as long as they can have two meetings per year. And all you had to do was pay the heating bill. That's it. It was rent free. Okay? So he used it as a church. They had no problem with all that. They thought it was a great idea. So he did all this. The first Sunday he got there and invited me the first Sunday to preach. I'm going to tell you what scared me, okay? Now I got two pit bulls. I love. I love pit bulls. I don't think there's anything wrong with pit bulls. Amen. So you say, Cheryl, amen. Say, come on, amen, right? So you go ahead in there, right? But this thing scared me now. I started preaching in this church. And it, and it's, you know what scared me? I saw this big tongue on the window. It was about that big. About that long. It was a cow. The cows were here next door. And this cow walked up to the window of the church. And I licked it up. I go, what in the world was that? Uh, the guy next door has a few cows next door. I'm like, whoa! Now I have no problem with pit bulls. I have no problem with Watts. I got no problem with all that. I, I, me, I can deal with scary people, ex-convicts. But man, when that cow came out to the window, man, I'm like, what? What happens if that thing comes to the window? Are we gonna have? Are we gonna have ground beef? Have some burgers? What's going on here? You have that under control? But that was the God's honest truth. And you know, you can call them up. You can ask them out. That's the first service I preached in that church for them, and that thing scared me. Okay, it really did. It's the truth. But can I tell you, our church is a little different. We don't have to deal with cows. Amen. We don't have to deal with we don't have to deal with well-to-do suburbanites. Because I, I should have named this question, we is what we is, amen? Right? That's exact our church is what we are, right? That's the way it is. And I can I tell you, I, I I wouldn't change a bit. You look at the history of Laurel, say amen on this one. The history of Charity Baptist Church, we were on the streets. And on those streets, we dealt with every drug dealer, every prostitute, every homeless person. Right on Genesee and Hickory, over to Grand Street and the storefront next to Zip Pizza, all the way over to Grider Street and Delavan, all the way to 85 Gardner. Okay, when they're asking the preacher to get rid of the drug dealers, they look at me like, I'm getting rid of the drug dealers. Say, what? You want me to get rid of the drug dealers? Get together and get a posse going on. Call the police. We do. They don't do nothing. Thank God I had one more call. 
Because the only person he had left was my Uncle Kenny and the pre he was chief of homicide, then he became the chief of no chief of narcotics, then he became chief of homicide. I said, it's starting to get scary around here. Okay, Corral bit. I really don't want to lock and load and have to do something stupid. So praise the Lord, they called and they did they did a 37 knock your door down sweep of the area. Congress, Herkimer. I don't know if you remember that back in the day. They just did the whole clean sweep. That was me. That's the only connection I had left. Amen. All my connections to the police department went out the door. I had no, I know nobody. You say, why was that so special? Because the folks that we were dealing with were getting triggered, were getting drawn into that stuff. I mean, I had to sit there and go back into the drug house to get my saw back. I say, give me my saw now before it's going to get ugly. I'll walk right in and grab it. I go, listen, it's going to get ugly. All right, all right, all right. Who gave it to you? So and so. Then I had to kick the other guy out of our transitional house because he sold my saw for his crack. That's how it went. That's how the nature, of the, uh, the nature it was, remember, back in the day. And we know many more stories like that, right, Janice? And, yep, I remember. It goes on and on and on. But listen, but these are folks that need to be reached. So what kind of church... When Walker Bible came down here this Tuesday, they said something. We, he, that's a very, I take this as an honor and privilege. You know what they said? Like a handful of the men? We need more churches like this in the cities around our, like Rochester and Syracuse, just like this to do the work that needs to be done. Can I tell you, I don't want to be like other churches. We need to be what God has told us to be and do what He told us to do. Amen? And I, and I want to do, there's one thing I want to encourage you with this. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. I want to go ahead and look at verse 9 to get things going here. Verse, verse 9. Okay. You say, why is this important? So we'll start right now in, in verse 9. <clears throat> we'll read down a little bit here. And it says here in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, me and Brother Steve, we went, we spent a Saturday here going over our overcomers class thing. You know, we kind of shared a little bit of that to some of the folks. It's quite different from Reframers Unanimous. And in that classroom, we've emphasized three things. Uh, 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he is in the world. The issue of repentance, may, tr truly turning yourself to Christ again, he's saved him more again, and then giving your life. You can get your soul saved, but you also better give your life to him too. Or you're headed for a battle down the road because you're going to be stuck between two worlds. And then number three, number three, Realizing the goodness of God because he doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to sit there. And it's going to take a lot of long suffering. I mean, Brother Steve shared in that, in his, in that room we're going over a lot, a lot of slip ups. Remember? Until he finally said, I'm done. No more slip ups. I'm done. And a lot of you here are maybe battling stuff with, with certain sins. You're, sooner or later, you're going to come to a point where you're sick of it enough. You're getting sick of going back to the vomit like the dog went back to the vomit. You're sick, sick of it. I said, I'm done. I'm going to repent no more because it's killing you. You're perishing in it. Can I tell you, listen, there's no drug on earth that can substitute, no drink on earth can substitute the joy and peace that only Christ can give. Amen? Amen? And repentance is the key. So what kind of church are we going to be? A church is going to be preaching? A church is going to be preaching repentance? A church is going to be long-suffering to the crowd we deal with? Especially Tuesday night, they come here, and it's good that a lot of our folks go out there and say, when are you going to get saved? You've been here for years hearing the same message over and over again. Are you ever going to get saved? Don't, don't be sure. Just say it in a very compassionate way. Very caring way because a lot of folks keep coming to come. But listen, I don't want them to stop coming because you just never know that next message. That next interaction might be the one to say, I need to get saved. I need, I'm done. You're right. I'm sick of it. You just never know. I'd rather keep them here to preach to them than put them out there on the streets and not hear nothing at all. We have to continue on and bring more in. Okay, so you sit there, let's go down a little further here real quickly. It goes on, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Now listen, see, why, is it, why do you keep your door open to folks that keep coming all the time? Because you never know, because you never know when that trumpet's going to sound. Your in interaction, this one last message might be the last for that soul. Either the heart stops, they go to heaven, or the trumpet sounds. Amen? It goes on here in verse 11. Uh, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons are you to be uh, in all holy conversation and godliness? Amen? 
How are you going to interact with that lost soul? How are you going to interact with that person? How are you going to interact with those souls that need to get saved? How are you going to sit there? Are you going to put aside your insecurities? Are you going to put aside your, your, your mindset of, of a possible pharisaical attitude? Holier than thou attitude. Uh, how about this one too? You can't put you can't put God. Well, I understood it when I yeah, you can, but they can't. Their blindness and their bondage might be different from yours. Only God knows it. Ask, ask God, keep praying for that soul that God can lift off the blinders. Ask God to sit there and rattle the heart so that they can come to get saved born again, the chains can break off. You are not the Holy Spirit, and you are not God that can save. It's only Him. Amen? Look over here real quickly, verse 12. Looking for the hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Amen? That's a good thing. Now look at, wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of Him in peace, without spot and blameless. Now, it's pretty impossible to be spotless and blameless, right? Right? I, never, I don't know anything about no sinless perfection. If you believe that, that's a, that's a false doctrine. There's no sinless perfection. But can I tell you, though, you, you could clean up every day. You read your Bible, you clean up. You read your Bible, you clean up. You go through life, you're going to get spotted. You're going to get something on you. This world, you're going to have a sin on you. If you show me the Bible, sinless perfection, I'll show you how there's a hundred other verses that you're not. But... Here's the thing. You could clean up every day. Whatever's going on, you could clean up. I, I, I talk to God in the morning. I talk to God before I go to bed. Because I'm going to get dirty during that day. Why am I going to do Because I'm going to be dealing with sinners. I'm going to deal with people. There's going to be things from my past pop in my head that I don't want to hear about. I don't want And all of a sudden you feel like, oh man, I sinned against God. Why, where in the world did that come from? Then you've got to repent of it. Give it to God. Put it under the blood. Focus on God. Get fixed on God. Remember, it's in the Holy Spirit's power, not yours. See, why are you doing this all for? I'm going to give you some verses here pretty quick here as I pray. Long introduction, short message. Verse 15. An account that the long suffering of the Lord is, is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the, the wisdom given unto him that written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them the things which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, and they, they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Destruction. There is a battle going on here. Now, can I tell you something here? Always err on the side of caution. People have taken these scriptures out of context for years. Even in independent, fundamental Baptist churches. When you see that word be perfect for I am perfect, does not mean perfection. Because you still got a robe of flesh that you got to deal with. Maturity is, is sitting. Listen, you're not ignorant of sitting any longer. You, you, when you first got saved, because you didn't have a lot of knowledge. Now you got a lot of knowledge and wisdom. You live life. You know what the Bible says. Now you're held accountable to that. Amen. Now you know a little bit what not to do, where to go, where not where to go, all that stuff. Now it's up to you to make the decision, the free will to do what you need to do. I'm going to tell you right here there's a lot of folks that are coming in. They know what they need to do, but they won't get saved. There's a lot of folks that are blinded and stuck in their bondage out there on the streets. They might have went to church as a little kid, and you'll find a lot of them in the city. You'll tell, I'll tell you, I used to sit there and work with people. I used to go to church. I used to go to church. I used to go to church. I do. There's a couple songs. You remember this song? Do you remember that song? I think I heard that before. I know that. But they won't do that. They won't receive that. So what are you trying to say, Pastor? What I'm trying to say is that there's people out there that know the truth, they've heard the truth, but they won't yield to the truth. They won't throw themselves at it. What better place to be open the door and be hospitable and show them the love of Christ than this church? When I first started the church, I had to ask some people to leave the church. And I asked them very nicely, can you please leave the church? I say, Why? Because you beating up people verbally is not going to help them get saved. You being so confrontational about all their shortcomings and weaknesses in the church will not help them grow in maturity. Why don't you love them and teach them and mentor them in maturity? 
They just couldn't get it. They couldn't connect the dots. I'd rather you come in all messed up, and then guess what? We'll clean you right up. We'll give you the word. We'll pray over you. We'll go ahead and let God work on your heart, mold you exactly what God wants you to be. Do you know why that's going to be? Because the Holy Spirit and God did that, not you. We, 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 are, we touch things. What turns the mush, don't it? How many here ever tried to make something happen and never, never worked out good? Yeah. I think y'all have the experience, right? It turns the mush. God has to do it, Chet. God has to do it. But we can sit there and be that delivery guy. We can be that person to allow God to do it. Can I tell you this morning, Paul was going around preaching the gospel. Paul had to overcome his reputation. Paul had to sit there and share the truth and love. Paul had to sit there and be hard, and, but yet loving and graceful and merciful. Look through all the epistles. You'll see that in those epistles. He had to sit there and come down to the levels of the Greeks and down to the levels of the barbarians. They had to approach two different groups differently. Amen? We need, I'm going to ask Chet after you're done. Now, I know you're probably going to have the whole place packed out. But then after you, I get to teach. And you know what's going to happen then, don't you? No one's going to show up for my Bible study. Okay? They're going to show up for Chet, but when Pastor Pete teaches, no one shows up. No one shows up. Just to let you know, mark it in the calendar, okay? The two weeks that Pastor Pete's going to teach is going to be about ministering and being ministered to. Mm -hmm. Two-way street, okay? So mark it down. If you miss out on it, it's also going to be talking about church operations in the midst of it all. Mark it down. <laughs> Tell your doctor you're not, on Thursdays you're not going to the doctors that day. If Aunt Sally's coming over, tell her to come on Friday. <laughs> Uncle Bob... Uncle Bob, come on Saturday. What, what day the, <laughs> the next two Thursdays is that man. Okay? And then I get the next two Thursdays after that. Okay? Okay. <sighs> All right. As I had a spiritual, let's pray. I'm going to give you some things here. I want you to see the, the importance of going after some of the forgotten people. Some of the people that no church would probably would want in the church because of their condition and their situation. Let's pray. Father, again, thank you for this time. I prayed again that here at Charity Baptist Church, our folks could get a rekindle of fire in their heart to not look down or overlook, but be sparked, to be encouraged, to have some zeal to invite more, to give a gospel track, to even witness and tell the gospel to these folks that maybe... They've been to church. They've been to many churches. They've been, <clears throat> they're messing around in sin. Their sin is blinding. They're in bondage. Folks, that's where great things happen when you see a life get converted from a life of sin onto death, but now onto Christ where they can live in holiness and righteousness, doing great things for you. Lord, I pray that you'll bless this message now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Five quick things. Number one, God, I don't know about you, but Many things that God has encountered, I always ask the Lord, so why in the world you give me always a building that's ready to fall apart? It's the truth. Remember, remember Grider? Ask my wife about Grider. How about 85 Gardner? And then here. And I always ask myself, you know what? I'm going to teach you something. Is you have to be patient with the building, you're going to have to be patient with a life and a soul. You can't Change a person in a matter of days. It takes years. You can't fix a house in a matter of days. It takes years. And all that involves is something. You've got to put your heart. You've got to put your blood. You've got to put your life into something. You've got to put, your, you gotta, you gotta put money investment in something. Just like a soul does. And as you see around the city, so many abandoned buildings boarded up and so many places are just abandoned and desolate and condemned. Just like a soul, just like a life, uh, people are condemned and going to hell because they're lost and they're undone. They're, they're not born again. They need Jesus. Amen? If you turn to your Bibles real quickly, if you could, to Galatians chapter 6. If you could, Galatians chapter 6. Uh, turn over there real quickly. Galatians chapter 6. We're doing good on time. It's not even quarter two. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6. I'm going to talk about some. There's many folks that I've met over the years. In this ministry, they used to go to church. Their family's gone to church. I'll name you two of them. There's a guy named Bill Spurlock. I found him sleeping, a homeless, underneath the um, 
33, right downtown, right past the detox clinic. Grabbed him up, brought him in right there on Tuesday afternoon to preach at City Mission. I dragged him in. I go, already went there. They kicked me out. I goes, nope, you're my guest. Let's go. So I, I walked in. He goes, he's my guest. You're not kicking him out. So I had him sit in the front row. I preached to him, right? He came up to me afterwards with tears in his eyes. because I heard this year, year after year, week after week. I says, my dad's a deacon at a Baptist church in, in Indiana, Muncie, Indiana. His name was Bill Spurlock. Didn't know anything about his past or anything else. Housed him up. Housed him up. And then he finally broke down and he confessed something to me. He goes, can I confess something to you? He says, can I tell you something? I go, sure, please tell me. He goes, I ran away from home. Here's a 26-year-old man telling me he ran away from home. I go, why? I said, I think God was punishing me. I got hooked on crack. Things were going south. I tried to go out and get a job. I got my girlfriend pregnant. The child was born with spinal bifida. I thought God was chastising me. I got all my family beating me down. They said they were Christians or beating me down. I couldn't show myself my face in the church house any longer. I couldn't be there any longer to face the ridicule, the heartache, the guilt of everything that was going on. So I just took off and ran. And so I was headed to Toronto, Canada. Then he ended up in Buffalo, New York. And what happened at that point on? We took him in at 235 Grider, tried to work with that man. Every day, just bawling his eyes out full of guilt and guilt and guilt and crying. We started praying. We worked on certain things. He knew. He goes, I know I'm saved, but I'm running. He showed me how to get. He goes, show me how you get saved. Go over to the Bible. He showed me right through all the Gospels the how to be saved and born again. He even said the word repentance. Now, come on now. How many people that are off the street know the word repentance? This young man did. After two weeks of being in there, cleaning himself up, cleaning himself up, detox for two weeks, 30 days in the detox, I come back to me. We start praying. He start reading his Bible, praying. All of a sudden he goes, I need to call my dad. So I gave him my phone. I go, call your dad. Whew. He begged his son to come back home. He says, you know what? He took care of the things with him and dad. He says, don't worry about the church. If the church can't receive you, then we're leaving the church. We're going to go to a church that will receive us. Amen. Think about that. Then he went ahead and he said, he said, when are you coming back? I go, no, i got to make arrangements. So I got on the phone and dad said, I'm going to give you money. I'm going to send you money. Put my son back on that Greyhound and get, me back, get him back to Muncie, Indiana with me. Got off the phone. A day later, he goes, I need to call my girl. I need to ask for forgiveness. Call that girl. Boom. Two weeks later, put him on a Greyhound bus. This is I had him for three, only three months. I only had that man for three months, a young man. But in three months, he gave himself back to God, got back in the book, started asking forgiveness and reconciling things with his parents. First of all, with God, his parents, and his girl because he abandoned that poor child and that, that woman of his child and went back on a Greyhound bus, clean, Bible in his hand, ready to go, go to church and get things back to where it needed to be. He was a deacon's son, a churchgoer, a faithful deacon in a church where the son went wrong somewhere. Can I tell you this morning, God is in the restoration business, amen? amen. He's in the restoration business. Here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Can I tell you something? What you do to other people to help restore their life back to God, you're going to want the same effect back to you too. Be very careful how you treat a situation, how you treat somebody, how you approach somebody when you're trying to bring them back to God and when you're trying to nurture them back to the things of God. Because guess what? One day, you're going to probably want the same thing whatever battle you're facing. Amen? You're going to want somebody that is spiritual, a pastor or another brother or sister in the Lord to come and encourage you to, to restore your life back to where it needs to be. Can I tell you, how many here agree with us? Amen? God's in the restoration business. I don't care how wicked, how vile your life is, and you're trying to pick and choose God, how, stum how much you're stumbling, how much your life is in, in ruins, how much your life is in disarray. Can I tell you this morning, 
God is in the restoration business. And I want to say this church right here is a perfect place to be restored. Not the church itself, but the type of things that we do in this church. The type of preaching that you're going to hear, the type of discipleship programs we have in store for you, whether it has to do with addictions, or has to do with just get a good foundation of, of doctors on your life. Right, brother? You guys got that stuff? We have all that. We want to sit there in the atmosphere, but we'll accept you. There's only three people I ever asked to leave this church. One is trying to take over the church. One causing division, trying to attack every church, every sheep possible, gnawing and kicking and biting at them all. And then number three, those are sowing so discord. Pretty biblical, isn't it? Don't you think so? Is that pretty biblical? When the brethren are gnawing on each other, they ain't no good. We got to find out who's doing all that and why, right? Who's sowing discord? Who's the tent? Listen, I want this place to be a place of restoration. You know why? Because he is. How many folks you know that are in disarray? Their life's a mess, and you know they need God. Think about that soul. Think about that person. Think about that lost soul. I don't care who it is. Think about it. That's the person we want to come in this church to get the help that they need. Amen? Number two. I want their life to be renewed. Amen? How many of you remember when you first got saved? Woo! It was fresh as a daisy. It was beautiful. New things, new things, new things, new things, right? <clears throat> Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Uh, Romans chapter 12 real quick. We all know what 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, right? You become, you become you're a new creature, amen? All things are passed away. All things become new. New! How, I mean, you read your Bible and boom, things come out brand new. <clears throat> you sit there like, I never knew that. Can I tell you the biggest battle I had? I used to fight with my pastor. That's why I, get, that's why I laugh and giggle when you come and try to fight with me. Because that was, I know you sow what you reap, Steve. I used to fight with my pastor. I'd say, no, I don't see that in the Bible. You're lying. I go, come here, let's do a little study. So two weeks we start studying it. And so when people come to me and Brother Rob, they go, we're... we're <sighs> Where do you see that? Well, let me show you. <laughs> I get a kick out of it because now, hey, now we got a Bible study. Let's get it on. Let's go. Come on. And they start teaching truth and showing truth. And now, guess what? You got to make decisions. I already made that decision already. Now you got to make decisions. Amen. But in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 says this I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. See that? Watch how merciful God is that you present your bodies. A living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable what? Okay, why is it? Listen, God has shown so much mercy on your life. Now it's time for you to serve him to show mercy on someone else. Amen? Didn't say put down the hammer on him. There's only a few times I had to put the hammer down around here. And I hated it. You know why? Because I like to be everything unified in love and unified in doing great things for God and glorifying God. You know, peace. And others. But there's times you might have to. And I don't want to go back there. Right, brother? I don't want to go. Harry's been probably through a lot of them already, right from the get-go. Okay? Because he has a smart, smart, he's level-headed, he's smart, he sees things very um, neutral. You know what I mean? He steps back and looks at things. He goes, that ain't right. And I go, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I need, we need level-headed. We need to see people to see things in a neutral place so you can see it. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Can I tell you, everything that comes in your head, you better check to make sure it's truth. There's a lot of fake this and fake that and fake this. There's a lot of false doctors, a lot of false teachers, a lot of false information out there. You better read up and do the research. research. I tell everybody all the time, do the research. Do the research. Read, read, read. Go in this Bible. Search, 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 search. See what God has to say. See where God stands on things. See how God looks at things. See how God feels on things. You know why? Because then you're going to get exactly how God thinks. Then guess what? You and I got to change to think just like him. Or else we're all the ones outside looking in. We're not. The, it says, renew your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Amen? We need to really, truly see how God is. Look, can I tell you something? One of the greatest joys is this. There's many people out there that are living in sin and seeing things. That God, the God of this world is blind to them. Amen? They have blinded them, it says there in 1 Corinthians 4. 4. They blinded them. So here, can I tell you, though? We have the truth that can unblind them. 
The Holy Spirit can unblind them to see it. And once they start seeing all the truth of things, they're like, wow. And then also their mind opens up. They're going to see so much greater things and more blessings than ever, ever before. Can I tell you this morning? Can I tell you this morning that God wants to touch your heart? God wants to help you. God wants to reach out and do something spectacular in your life to be able to sit there and see the great works that God has in store. But they got to get the information. They got to hear Bible. They got to sit there mind renewed. Number three, turn over to Psalm chapter 85 if you could. Psalm chapter 85. Psalm chapter 85. Psalms chapter 85. That's Old Testament, right? No one got up. No one was even, look, no one's even talking to me. You're ignoring me. I'm trying to see if you guys are awake. Well, you might that's a good thing. Psalm chapter 85. Look at the starting verse 1. Lord, thou hast been my fair belong to the land. Thou hast brought back the cap captivity of Jacob. Thou hast forgiven the iniquity of thy people and hast covered all their sins, Selah. Thou hast taken away all thy wrath. Thou hast turned my, thyself from fierceness of thine anger. Turn us, O God, of our salvation, and cause thy anger toward us to cease. Wilt thou be angry with us forever? Wilt thou draw out thy anger to all generations? Wilt thou not revive us again? You cannot live and have true life unless you get Jesus. You gotta remember, you're struggling, you're striving, you're struggling, you're clawing, you're, you're just all that stuff. Can I tell you this morning, one of the greatest things you could do is get your life revived. You know, I'm going to tell you this right now. I see a lot of people walking around. You ever talk to some folks? You hear a lot of, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. You know what they're saying? They have no purpose. They don't know if they're coming or going. They don't even know why they're even here. What's going on in my life? Who am I? What am I doing? Why do I even exist? Am I really alive? They have nothing. They're void. Okay, look up here. That's a good thing. Do you know why? Because you have the answer. You have the opportunity to revive that life. Just as, just as God took the sand of the ground and put together a body and breathed in the nostril a living soul. Amen? You can also bring, look at now, some life. There's words of, wonderful words of life. Amen? We sang that a few weeks ago. Wonderful words of life. The wonderful words of life that bring forth something in a person's life. That bring something to, to when people come alive again. You won't understand unless you get down in a valley. How many of you have been down in a valley before in your life? Anybody here been down in a valley? When you're down in a valley and you're scraping and clawing to sit there to survive, and you just don't know what's going to happen. All of a sudden, you grab your Bible, and God spoke to you, and all of a sudden, you start crying with joy. You start crying with joy. You start, you start sitting there going, man, that's what I need. And all of a sudden, you got a smile on your face. You get energized. You feel, you feel lifted. Love lifted me. See? And you'll probably understand that God does love you. You're not alone. God does love you. You're not alone. This is what you're here and you're dear. God realized who you are and what you are. You got something there special. You found out exactly what he needs to do. What thou be angry with this forever that goes on here it says, Show us thy mercy, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. I will hear what God and the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace unto his people and unto his saints. But let them not turn again to folly. Surely his salvation is nigh. Them that fear him, that glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Look at you got to give truth to the person, but you better do it with some mercy. Remember, one day you were blinded too. One day you were you were almost like not even alive. Like, why am I here? What is my purpose? I feel empty inside. Then Christ came along. Someone brought Christ to you and showed you the love of Jesus to your heart and to your soul. Mercy and truth came. They came. Amen? Can I tell you, we need, to, we need to continue being that church to restore. We need to keep being that church that's going to keep renewing that mind and teaching truth and preaching truth and showing people all of how good God is, all his character, all his personality, all his mind, all his heart. And we need to help God revive these people's lives. Listen, we're living in a hopeless society today. 
And you're right, Brother Steve, they're living in fear left and right. What's the opposite of fear? Faith. Faith is this big sometimes, but faith needs to be this big. Faith should be overcoming fear. Faith should be, a Christian should be living by faith. The just should live by faith. Faith should be the, for, the foremost thing in our mind is by faith. I didn't say be dumb about things, have discernment, but we should need to have, if we need to have faith. Amen? Amen. Number four. Turn real quick, if you could, to Colossians chapter 1. We're doing good on time here. Oh my God. One more point that I'm going to close. <clears throat> See, what in the world? Did we all know that one day, mm, Colossians chapter 1, I'm going, to, I'm going to go ahead and share this. I'll show you another verse while we're turning there. Colossians, that's in the New Testament. It's after Philippians, amen. General Electric Power Company. I got that one? How many knew that? How many knew that one? General Electric Power Company, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. No, I didn't know that. Write that down. See? <laughs> they're gonna, this is what they're only going to remember about my message is that. Everything else they can forget about. They're going to remember General Electric Power Company. That's the only thing they're going to remember today, Steve. Everything else is out the door. All right. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1. Look at verse 19 through 22. says this. It says, For it, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things on himself by him. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath been reconciled. Hallelujah. Verse 22, In the body of his flesh through the death, to present you holy and unblameable and un unreprovable in his sight. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which ye have preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I just gave away my Bible study there, verse 23. But anyways, look up here. God, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, there was something that was broke. Now it's fellowship. God couldn't fellowship with Adam and Eve any longer. Sin entered the picture. But in Genesis 3.15, he promised something to happen. And that was that Messiah. And then when Christ died on the cross and shed his precious blood, we have now access back to God through his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, where we can actually, as our mediator, to be able to pray to and, and talk to and fellowship again once we get saved and born again. See, why did, he, why did Jesus die? <clears throat> it wasn't just because he had to show love. Because he wants to love everybody. No, no. Because he wants to fellowship with everybody. Because he wants that communion with everybody. He lost that because of sin. Uh, entered the picture and sin blocked that connection. Praise the Lord for that. You don't have to turn it, but in 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says this, For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God had to make, pay a price with his son. Amen? So we can have access back to him. Can I tell you this morning? Look up here. God loves you. God wants to be with you. We, people that are why they're empty inside and they're longing for something, they're searching for something because they lost their connection with God and it only comes to the Lord Jesus Christ through there. It doesn't come through religion. I don't care if it says Baptist out front, Bible church over here, this denomination, that denomination. It has nothing to do with it. But it has to do with the person, the person of Christ Jesus, our Lord. He's the one that God sent. No one else. Not me, not anybody else you know. He sent his only begotten son so you can get saved and born again, so you can have access right to him for sweet fellowship. Get your life restored. Get your mind renewed. Get your life revived again. And get reclaimed, reclaimed back to God again because sin destroyed it in the garden. He paid the penalty. The first Adam didn't do it, but the second Adam did, amen? amen. Took care of business. Now you can come back to God again. There's no more bridge. Not according to your works. Your works don't do nothing. Christ already did those works. It's not a works, works of righteousness that he done, amen, but according to his mercy he saved us. It was because of his works. It's not of our works. He did all the work on the cross. He reclaimed, he reclaimed us to be with him again. Amen? amen. Last point. He redeemed us, amen? amen. Kind of goes right, segues right in there pretty good. Don't want to redeemed. You can live through life. You can try your best. 
but you'll never hit the marker of what Christ did for you. Amen? You're paying the price of certain sins, you're paying the price of certain ways, but you're still empty, you're still not full, you're still void, you're still not there. Can I tell you this morning, you need to be redeemed. How many here remember when you got redeemed? The, no, can I tell you, the longer I live in Christ, the more I see how much, look at now, how deep his love is, how big of a price he paid, how awful the price he paid, how, man, the balance of everything on it, the balance of everything on it, right? And now you finally see it for what, is, what it really worth. You can never truly understand the price, how big that price was until you see how wicked of a sinner we really were and how much we needed God. Amen? Amen. When you realize that, you'll see something. And God, the Lord Jesus Christ redeemed us to pay the penalty of sin in our, in our, in our flesh, in our life. See, what sin is that? Now, people say, well, isn't the rejection of Christ the sin that you're talking about? Absolutely. But you might not look at it. People in their life might not know that that's the sin that they're thinking about all the different sins. But your lifestyle of sin is, showing, is showcasing your rejection of him. It's just not one sin or this sin. It's the rejection of him. If, if God already supplied the answer, God sent his only, his, 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 the gift of God, Right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The gift is in G the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who God sent. And the wages of sin is death, but he says, I got a gift to God, which is what? Eternal life. Eternal life. He wants to give you life eternal. That means life forever. Not in your conditions or by your works, but what he did, his works. And all you have to do is repent and believe in him and believe all that he did. If you take anything back, then you're putting faith in yourself. Then that's not salvation. That's not being born again. You're putting trust back in yourself again when it should have been all in Him. Can I tell you, you've been redeemed. He paid a penalty. Turn real quickly, if you could, to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. As you're turning to Titus chapter 2, I'll read this real quickly. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16 says this, Redeem in the time, because the days are evil. How many agree with the days are evil? <laughs> you keep watching the news and everything. Like, walk around the neighborhood for a little bit, right? Are the days evil? Yeah. Woo, scary times. But you know what? You and I have a job to do. You and I have the gospel, the Lord Jesus Christ. You and I have, have the precious truth, the word of God that comes in this Bible. We have a whole track rack and we got more that came in. Mrs. Jones he goes, I got more to, you know. I've never seen a woman get so excited about stamping tracks. I hate doing that. I really, I can't stand stamping tracks. How many here, I don't like that. Mrs. Jones goes, whippee! <laughs> all right! Hallelujah! They're all yours! I don't know what you're doing over there. And you can, listen, when, you, when that happens, you can say it's a good excuse for you to order out that day. Tell your husband, we're ordering out today, why? I'm stamping tracks. We're gonna, let's get the pop going and Kool-Aid and let's order out. Amen? Redeem in the time. We have our arsenal. We have everything we have at our disposal. We have all the toolbox to go. But we've got to go out there and we've got to preach the gospel. We've got to go out there and tell people about Jesus. Here in Titus chapter 2, look at verse 14. Titus chapter 2 and in verse 14 says this, Who gave himself for us. That's not our Lord here. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Whoo, is that a good thing? I don't want to live in my sin anymore, Pastor Pete. I don't want to continue like this. My life's most miserable. Then get saved and born again. Don't walk around being feeling empty and void. Don't feel walk around uh, having uncertainty of the next day. I already know what's going to happen. If I die, you know where I'm going the next day? You can't threaten. No one can threaten me with death. I'm going to kill you. Go ahead. I know where I'm going. I had it up to you. I'm going to... I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill you. Pfft, bring it on, baby. Someone's going down. If you kill me, I already know where I'm going, right? I'm going to kill I'm like, don't ever threaten me with that stuff, because I get excited when it happens. I'm going to heaven when I die. Amen? The world's going to end. Bring it. Let's go. And I start practicing. Amen? Redeem the time. Redeem it. Redeem it. Redeem it. It goes on here. It says, Where, who gave himself up for, uh, for us that he might redeem us 
from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people. How many here are crazy for Jesus? How many here are, are a Jesus freak? How many here are a Bible thumper? How many, what's another one? Give me some more other ones. What's that? How many here are brainwashed? I'm, wa I'm washed in the word, renewing my mind. I'm brainwashed on Jesus. I don't care. I'll use the brittle pen of the scriptures and the soap of the word and the Holy Spirit. Scrub it, scrub it, scrub it, scrub it. Amen? And I'll sit there and I'll deal with any theologian, any agnostic and atheist, what they want to believe because we'll have a heyday together. Remember, I have two years of engineering, okay? And I love acting dumb because it comes natural, amen? <laughs> so the dumber I act in front of the theologians and the intellectual crowd, I love it because then they start bringing up these big words. Oh, I know that. <laughs> you know that? I go, sure, have a seat. And then, then I can bust out my, not I can bust out my intellect, my two years of UB. Intellect. How do you like that one? So you draw them in, Steve. Get that and try. See, Byron, you draw them in. You draw them in acting dumb and, un and uneducated. So I said uneducated. No one got that one. Uneducated. That's that ghetto term for educated. Uneducated. Bring them in there and then you go ahead and just lay it all the load on there. they like, how you know? I know more than you think. <laughs> never, sh never show your hand, right? right. Amen? Never sh a procure people, zealous of good works. Can I tell you what's really exciting about this year? It's all this garbage going on. Can I tell you one thing that's really exciting? We did the outdoor service without a hitch. Then we went to the street corner. So we said, we're done with this stuff. Once they started burning down City Hall, or trying to at least, I said, we're having church. We're done with this baloney. Done. Get it open. Right? Outdoor service, preaching on the street corner. They don't know what to expect from us anymore. Ha ha ha. Because we're peculiar. Why? Because we're zealous in good works. Nothing wrong with that. Can I tell you, though, where I want you to, to really pray about coming in truth? I mean, I'm not even doing a New Year's service, yet, but let's get back and focusing on the forgotten people. Those that need to be restored. Those folks that know Christ but need to be renewed. Some lies that are staggering around. Used to go to church, used to, used to come into church, used to serve God. They need to be revived. How about those folks that sit there and you hear great stories of what they used to do, but they went back in the world. They need to be reclaimed. And then go out there, of course, with the gospel and tell others about Jesus so they can be redeemed. You say, what's our identity here at Charity Baptist Church? This message right here. This is a message I probably would say, pretty say, what is Charity Baptist Church all about? What do you stand for? What is your vision? What is your mission statement? What do you, what do you envision your church being and doing? I just told you this all this whole morning. And I hope this will be a place that you would call home. Would you want to be part of a ministry like that? Not just look, you know, you can only look good and act all holy and biblical and all, all that great stuff, but I want someone that's ready to get their hands dirty. You know, Psalm 40, in that miry pit, pulling them out, put them on their, on that, put their feet on that rock, amen? Can I tell you something? We need more Christians who are willing to get dirty. That will show some mercy and compassion to people. Allow God, let, let God save some souls and give them a chance. I know a lot of ministries that start off their ministries that way, but then they got too prim and proper for their no good. And they forgot about the down and outer. They forgot about the one in the pit. They didn't want to bother the one that ruined their life because it's too, they're too far gone. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure God's hand can reach down anywhere he wants to go and reach as far as he wants to go and pick anything up. Nothing's too heavy. No one's a lost cause. When you say it's a lost cause, and all you do is give it to God because God doesn't think so. There's times where I had to say, God, I, I, did my, I did my best with this person. I can't go any further. But God, here he is. He's all yours. I can't do no more until they want to come see me. They want to at least spend time with me. Or they want my health, the word of God. Then you just give them over to God. Amen? Can I tell you this morning, looking to finish off this year and looking into 2021, you see, what is Charity Baptist Church all about? What is identity? What is, the, what is its uniqueness? This message you heard this morning. Those people that are thrown away and overlooked. Those forgotten people that no one's having a church because they're too much work. There's too much to deal with. 
They're just, you can't do nothing with them. Can I hear what our church say? Oh, they're not good tithers. When they, oh, you're running a business or a church? <laughs> right? right? Right, Brother Harry? Are you running a church or are you running a business when you hear that? Number two, we got better things to do. We got to put our energy into other things. You're talking about a soul right now. You can find better things to do than a person's soul? That's wicked. Amen. Say amen, right? Amen. Right? I mean, that's true. How about number three? Well, he's too far. They, they, that person's too far gone. I don't know you're going to go through to him. Really? If everybody thought about that with me, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And you, and you, and you, everybody here, right? Why are you putting God in a box? Let God do it. It takes prayer and service and work on it. Amen? amen? Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. Every head bowed, every eye closed. No one looking around. I'm going to ask you two questions today. As Brother Rob gets ready for our invitational song. Pastor P, I'm here today. I'm not saved. I'm not born again. I do not know for sure if I died, I'll be in heaven when I die. But I have a little emptiness inside my heart. I'm not really sure anything about Jesus. I'm not really sure if I, got, if I, if I were to die, I'd be in heaven with him. But boy, what I heard today, God doesn't forget me. I'm glad that God doesn't overlook me. I'm glad that God cares and loves me enough that I'm not going to be just thrown away in society and in life, that someone truly does care, and that's God and this church and these people. How many of you can raise your hand and say, Pastor Peter, I not truly know if I'm saved or born again, but man, I would really like to know how to be saved and born again. Anybody here this morning with a raised hand, I want to pray for you. Is there anybody here, I, don't, I do not know for sure if I died, I would go to heaven, but man, I would like to know how to be saved and born again. Anybody here at all? Let me pray for you. Okay, number two. Maybe you're here today and you're a Christian. Maybe your heart needs to be rekindled. Maybe your heart needs to be more compassionate, more merciful. Maybe you start looking at souls a little differently to see that they need Jesus, they redeemed and restored their life, and they'd be reclaiming back to Jesus because the sins lost them. Maybe nurture and mentor them May they are saved. They need to get their mind cleared and get more of the Word of God in them. You and God only know.